All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Dwayne McKenna. I'm a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. I'm co director of the Agriculture and Food Technologies Research Cluster here at the University of Memphis, along with my colleague, Dr. Pratik Banerjee, who had a conflict that they even can't be here today. Um, well, happy, very happy, in fact, today to have with us a friend of mine. We actually first met in graduate school just a couple of years ago. Yeah, a couple of years ago. Um, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and uh, John has since uh, done many other things, moved on to Penn State University in the Department of Entomology, where he's a professor and an extension specialist. So, you know, John has, uh, in some ways, broad-ranging research, but that's sort of natural when you're fundamentally, in many ways, an ecologist working at interfaces. And so the kinds of work that he does are in the areas of insect-plant interactions and agricultural systems, chemical ecology, induced post-plant defenses, natural enemies, insecticides, and integrated pest management. And there's more. Uh, that doesn't really do justice to the very few things he's So, you know, John's published lots of papers. He wouldn't tell you this, but over 100, including some very widely cited and popular ones in the sense that they are relevant to the development of theory and ecology and evolution and certainly application in areas like agriculture. So one thing that has impressed me about his work and seeing it develop over the years from afar is the number of really talented graduate students he's trained. There's five currently, if I'm right, five PhD students, yeah, postdocs and so on. Um, at the same time, as part of the extension component, the responsibilities, of course, he's interfacing with people on the ground doing work in agricultural settings. And so in that sense, it is a keen observer of what it takes to be a communicator of science, and for that matter, an advocate of science, which of course is important. So, so I think, too, his work exemplifies the understanding of ecology and evolution to address challenges at the interfaces in agriculture, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and other sort of aspects of a rapidly changing planet. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. Look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, and thanks, Dwayne, for that nice introduction. That's far better than I could ever do, um, and I wouldn't do what you just did, so that's fine. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, in Memphis. It's uh, wonderful to be in a community where there's so much enthusiasm for a place, and you guys seem to have that. That's great. Um, so Dwayne asked me to talk about my work in agriculture. Uh, most of the conversations that we had this morning, agriculture didn't come up at all, <laughs> and that's just because I have a little bit of an attention deficit problem, and I like some other things. Um, but what I'm going to tell you is more or less a story that re revolves around my interactions with some farmers and a problem that they had and how we have come to not solve it, but certainly get it uh, kind of on the run. Um, and it has to do with, uh, with, with what we call toxic slugs uh, and integrated pest management, which is IPM. And so that's where we'll kind of come back to uh, time and time again is, is IPM. Um, and in grad school, you can have full classes on IPM. So there's semester-long courses on IPM. I'm just going to talk about it briefly. If you haven't had too much exposure to it, I'm trying to, I'll give you some pieces that you need to know. But this is my, my current uh, lab group. Uh, diverse bunch of folks that are all kind of enthusiastic about plant-insect interactions, typically in agricultural systems, but I do have a, a soft spot for gall-inducing insects and, and, and goldenrod, which is some of the conversations we had this morning. So. We get outside um, of agriculture every once in a while, and we do study some native plant insect interactions. So my appointment at Penn State is a research uh, extension appointment, and so about 50% of the time, I'm supposed to be helping the farmers of Pennsylvania with their pest problems. And my uh, commodity assignment is field crops of Pennsylvania. So that's corn, soy, wheat, alfalfa, those types of things. Uh, depending on the state you're in, that suite is going to be different, but in my realm, those are the big ones. And my main interests revolve around uh, harnessing ecological interactions to help with pest control. Uh, and part of that um, involves scrutinizing current pest management practices, and you'll see that today. So widespread pest management practices that farmers have adopted uh, that might not be the best in all situations, okay? 
And I'm particularly interested in conservation biological control, and that's simply conserving beneficial insects that can help with pest control. So conserving predators and parasitoids in the landscape. So perhaps we don't need to use inputs as heavily. And if I was to tie together all the work that, um, the work, uh, that my students and postdocs do, we're trying to understand the biotic factors that influence herbivore populations. And some of these are top-down effects, so natural enemies doing things that limit, it, that limit herbivore populations. Some of them also are bottom-up effects, where the plant is kind of driving the interaction. But then we get into details like this, where crop management practices stress various types of diversity, whether it be species diversity or genotypic diversity, can alter how effective that top-down or bottom-up effects are. And that's where I think a lot of the interest, uh, really interesting stuff we found has been um, located. And my strong belief is if we better understand these interactions, then we can implement integrated pest management a whole lot easier. All right? So the, the story that I'm going to tell today um, starts with a PhD student named Maggie Douglas. Uh, this is Maggie uh, speaking at a congressional briefing. We were invited down to Washington, D.C. to talk about her research. It just emphasizes that what she found is pretty cool. Um, and in this story, we're finding herbivores are benefiting from relaxed top-down control. But So by not having as many predators around, the uh, herbivores are doing better. So in a simple um, tritrophic interaction, you would expect some direct interactions, some indirect interactions between these three types of players. And more or less what Maggie found is that because of a man-made impo uh, imposition on an agricultural system, these connections are being messed up. And I'll give you some of the details as we go along. So we'll start by just talking about no-till agriculture. Pennsylvania is a no-till state. So most of our fields don't see plows. So this is a no-till cornfield, and residue can build over time because the soil is never turned over. So about three quarters of our large acreage crops in Pennsylvania are not plowed. So again, that's corn, soy, wheat, alfalfa, and the like. And there are clear benefits of no-till. One of the benefits of no-till is just farm labor time. So you don't, a farmer doesn't have to drive across the field as much. A farmer doesn't have to use as much labor to do that. So they're decreasing their input costs because they don't have as much time invested, they don't have as much fuel invested. Then there are clear advantages that come from conserving soil and water resources. You may remember that the Dust Bowl came from tillage. Just to remember your U.S. history class. So by not tilling, we're going to avoid that issue. And just to remind you, so tillage is more or less plowing, and it's been done for hundreds of thousands, no, tens of thousands of years, um, mainly to prepare the seedbed and as a weed control approach. But the innovations in farming have led to um, various places adopting no-till more heavily than others. Uh, this is the, these are data from the USDA um, Ag Census, which last occurred in 2012. Apparently the 2017 data are going to come out in 2020. I haven't seen them yet, so these data are a little bit dated, but just shows the ratio of no-till ground to tilled ground, and the darker blue in Pennsylvania, and heck, in even Tennessee, you can see we have higher adopters of no-till than other parts of the world, right? And in Pennsylvania, what this no-till is trying to avoid is depicted in this map, right? You may not remember your mid-Atlantic geography very well, but I'll remind you, this is where Philadelphia is. This is the top of the Delmarva Peninsula. Delmarva Peninsula is Delaware, Virginia, and Maryland coming together. This is uh, um, where the Delaware River comes out, and this is the Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the world, and it is fed by the water from central Pennsylvania. So this is the Susquehanna River, which drains all of central Pennsylvania, and State College and University Park, where Penn State is, is just up there in the middle. This image is taken after Tropical Storm Lee, which occurred in September of 2011, and dumped like 15 inches of rain on the state in like 15 hours. Some crazy like that. So a whole lot of rain is washing Pennsylvania topsoil down into that bay. That sediment loading is, of course, decreasing the productivity of the bay, and people rely on the bay for fishing and crabs and all sorts of all, all sorts of stuff beyond just recreation. So this is not good. If you were in the bay on that day or the day after, the water turns red because of all that soil, and that is Pennsylvania soil mostly washing into the bay. So no-till on a daily basis is trying to avoid this. When you have that much of a rain event in that, such a short period of time, you're going to get some of this. But on a daily basis, no-till is trying to avoid this type of sediment loading in the bay. 
there's been kind of a struggle to get farmers to adopt no-till. There have been a lot of governmental um, uh, policies put in place, but farmers are often reluctant to go from no-till, from, from tillage to no-till, in part because they think their pest populations are going to be worse. They think their pest population is going to be worse in part because of the weeds. As an entomologist, I'm going to ignore that, but weeds are a huge part of this story. But from an entomological perspective, farmers also believe that their insect pests are going to be worse when they stop tilling their soil because they see pest management value in that tilling. But this question hasn't been answered very well. So one of my graduate students, Elizabeth Rowan, um, simply asked this question, does no-till make insects, pests, and predators more abundant? And if you look in the literature, there are, um, there are a couple papers here and there that have an opinion one way or the other on it. So they call those variable results. And then if you talk to farmers, there are anecdotes they'll tell you. But you really don't have a good picture of it because it's hard to do this study. So Elizabeth took advantage of her good quantitative skills and did a meta-analysis. She wrote to her friend Carly Regan here. And did a, they did a great meta-analysis that just came out in January. And I'll just give you the, uh, the, the quick answers rather than show you the, the figures and get bogged down in the details. Is that no tillage does not? I'm sorry, no till does not make pest populations worse. In fact, pests are about equivalent in no till fields and in tilled fields. But notably, foliar pests are more abundant in the more disturbed setting. So where you're tilling more, you actually get more pests in the leaves of plants. And this is across corn, soybeans, and vegetables, and cotton. Um, so that's kind of a that's kind of counterintuitive, but the meta analysis re revealed that. Um, and then from the predator side, so these are good animals we want to have in fields to help protect our crops so we don't have to use as many inputs. The predators are more abundant in no-till systems. So from these results, we know that conservation is the, uh, the no-till can be the basis of conservation. So if we stop tilling, we actually get more predators, and those predators can then help with the pest. Okay? So I know that was a quick um, overview. Um, but I don't want to get too bogged down in those details. It's kind of a general background to get us started. So in no-till, we have more soil-associated predators, and we have an equal abundance of pests between a tilled and no-till system. But in a no-till system like this, we have a slightly different suite of pests, and those pests might be more challenging to control. You don't need to know these things, but just to share some of the details, that pests like black cutworm, true <laughs> armyworm, and wireworm are more problematic in no-till fields than in tilled fields. But the pests that really attracts attention are slugs. And this is a picture of slugs on the front of a hay mower, and that is a lot of slugs. This gentleman didn't know he had a slug problem until he harvested his hay field at night. Slugs are nocturnal, and they were up on the plant available to his hay mower when, it, when he went through mowing his hay. So you can see the individual slugs down here, and it kind of grades into this wonderful sheen of slugs. As an avid entomologist um, or a lover of, of, of animals, um, I love seeing a lot of animals at one place at one time. So this is very gratifying, at least to me. But I don't have to tell you folks that that is not an insect. There are reviewers of my grants who don't know that's not an insect. There are grade school students that don't know that's not an insect. But it's not an insect, right? What is the phylum that that guy occurs in? Slug, yeah, what's the phylum? Dwayne knows, but he's not going to brag. Everyone remember the phylum? Mollusca, thank you, right, so that's a mollusk, right? Mollusks and arthropods are fairly, you know, fairly uh, distantly related to each other, and they don't even see any segmentation in that animal, so you know it can't be that closely related to an insect. But I would say that if you want to kill a mollusk, you should use a molluscicide. If you were a group of farmers and I asked, well, how do you control a mollusk? They would say a boot or a brick or something like that, right? But if you want to kill a mollusk, you would use one of those things, but more correctly, you would call it a molluscicide. To kill an insect, you would use an insecticide. Um, so but part of my story will be that we can't kill that with just your average stuff, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll get into the, kind of the details. Understanding that slugs might not be on your radar screen, um, they can be very hard on crops. They're particularly hard on corn and soybeans. And soybeans, they can be hard because the growing tip of soybeans is above ground and available. So this is a, a more or less a dead soybean plant because the cotyledons have been eaten off. That slug is going to town on that uh, set of cotyledons, and that plant will be dead not too long. This is a, a soybean field in southern Pennsylvania that has been replanted three times because of slugs. 
So the farmer just gets frustrated and sees he doesn't have a good stand, goes and plants it again and plants it again. And this is after the third planting. And I would trust you would believe that if you were a farmer, this is not an acceptable outcome. Okay. <coughs> so slugs can virtually damage any crop that they want. If you're a backyard gardener, you'll see them frequently in your peas or your spinach or your lettuce. But in large acreage field crops in Pennsylvania, we see them oftentimes in canola. Canola is a, is a less common crop, but they really love it. Kind of like candy to them. If I have a farmer that's using cover crops and they have a canola or, I'm sorry, a brassica in their cover crops, my first inf- advice is to remove it because slugs like it so much can really drive the population. Then, of course, they love soybeans. They love alfalfa and small grains. And they like corn, but they don't love corn. And actually, corn is nutritionally imbalanced for them, and they'll eat more than they need to to get enough protein. They actually overeat on corn, and the damage is bad. Um, but all they're trying to do is get enough protein. So corn is nutritionally imbalanced, and I'll return to that idea in a little bit. So there's a, uh, an estimate from the University of Delaware, who's, of course, in the Mid-Atlantic, that about 20% of the Mid-Atlantic no-till acres suffers from slug damage each year. So that's either um, uh, direct uh, yield loss from slug feeding or a stand establishment problem. Okay? And one of the problems is there are very few cost-effective management options. You can go to your chemical dealer, if you have a caterpillar problem, you can probably buy 20 different insecticides. And there's a, a wide range of things. If you have a slug problem and went to your chemical dealer, they have one option. Right? It's an active ingredient called medaldehyde. Uh, there's a new one on the market these days that hasn't been very well tested, but it's an iron-based bait. But more or less, you just have a few options in the chemical realm to manage slugs. And what we're seeing is that farmers are so frustrated with their slug problem that they're actually returning to tillage. So the best way to manage slugs is with tillage. And if we put all this effort into going to no-till to protect, to protect the Chesapeake Bay and water resources, having slugs drive people back to tillage is going in the wrong direction. So my group has been studying slugs. They're not a very compelling animal, um, but they're out there. Uh, we can find four different species in our Pennsylvania no-till field, and we've been trying to study all these interactions. We know that slugs can feed as uh, predators. They can also feed as scavengers. They'll feed on other things besides the crops. They'll feed on the crops. They'll also feed upon weeds. So we think we can take advantage of their food preferences, try to help control them. But we've really been focusing on things that like to eat them. And we have a fair amount of data on that. And my story basically revolves around things that like to eat slugs. The main slug species we have is this introduced species called Deraceris reticulata, or the gray garden slug. And that's the main one that we suffer from. This is a pattern we noticed early on in our kind of research efforts with slugs. On the vertical axis, we, are, we have the number of slugs per trap. And to trap slugs, we just put out pieces of shingles. So these are actually white shingles you might have on your house. We cut them up into little pieces, and then we go out and count the number of slugs. It's fairly low tech. And this is the corn growing season. And the two lines represent either corn that was grown with a seed treatment or an insecticide applied to the seed or not. So the blue line is a naked seed. So there's no insecticide on the seed. The red line is a clothianidin treated seed, which is a neonicotinoid insecticide. And on average, over the growing season, it looks like we have more slugs where we have the insecticide in the system. So just a little background on the neonicotinoid insecticides. I'm going to feature them fairly heavily. You've probably heard of them in the news. Uh, Various researchers have tied them to bee populations. Um, but I'm, not, I'm going to uh, avoid pollinators entirely, um, but they are certainly relevant to our story. They're a central player in our story. So neonicotinoid insecticides, the great majority of these things are being used as seed coating. So they're coated onto a seed. That seed is put into the soil. That insecticide is then pulled into the soil through capillary action, and when the root starts to grow, the plant takes it up. So these run systemically in plants. They're water-soluble. Okay. So anything that bites this young plant is going to get a dose of the insecticide. The only question is whether that animal is susceptible to that insecticide and whether it gets a dose large enough to be problematic for that animal. Okay. So these things can certainly protect yield if there are insect pests around. There's no doubt about that. But the question really becomes oftentimes, is the pest around? So do they have value? Um, they can have value if the pest is around. So they, they appear to provide a nice target application because you're putting the insecticide right on the seed. And then that insecticide is taken up into the plant. Uh, They have this systemic activity, which provides value because you're protecting a very young plant at its most vulnerable stage. Um, And you're applying what appears to be a very low dose. And that low dose has a very uh, minimal effect on vertebrates uh, and most uh, mammals particularly. And it's one of the reasons that these things went through the registration process kind of so easily. 
In our hands, we don't see any yield benefits to using these things. I will acknowledge that other researchers have found yield benefits. In central Pennsylvania, we do not see these advantages. So this is kind of bushels per acre on the uh, vertical axis um, in soybeans that have no coating on the seed and a seed coat, and the same thing for corn. Um, but this isn't because the insecticide doesn't stop insects. It's because the pests are infrequently encountered in Pennsylvania crop fields, particularly on a research farm and some adjacent land. We rarely find the insects we're trying to control. So the insecticide can't have much value unless the insect pest is there. An interesting detail about neonic insecticides that we ran into is there's a very poor understanding of how much they're used and where they're used. And in fact, the, uh, the EPA and the USDA aren't tracking this information, um, in part because of something called the treated article exemption, which is written into FIFRA. So FIFRA is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, or Rodenticide Act of 1996, and that governs how insecticides and uh, fungicides and rodenticides are used in the United States. And in there, there's something called the treated article exemption, that as soon as you put an insecticide on something else, it is no longer tracked as an insecticide. So while we coat something on a seed, it's no longer an insecticide. EPA, USDA, more or less, don't have to keep track of it. That's a simplified version uh, of it, and not entirely true, but let's just go with it, all right? So um, what we've been trying to do, or my former student Maggie tried to do, is actually estimate the amount of, uh, of neonic use as seed treatments, just to get a kind of a baseline or something to, for people to respond to. And Maggie figured out she could do this by comparing a US geological survey um, a USGS survey survey and a um, USDA survey and could compare the two and she could actually get out the amount of neonics being used in the United States over time. And I'll show you an image, uh, a couple images that show the amount of usage. So there's a, uh, there's a poorly placed belief in the world that homeowners are using just as many agricultural chemicals as farmers are. Uh, when it comes to the neonics, that is not the case at all. While there certainly is an abundance of insecticides, if you go down the, 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 um, the right aisle at Home Depot or Lowe's or a store like that, they're all neonics on the shelf. The great, great, great majority of chemicals, of these types of chemicals being used in the United States are being used as crop chemicals. So this is the amount of neonics over time, and you can see the different classifications there. The red is crop chemicals. The uh, orange is turf and ornamental. The blue is long and garden, and those are the chemicals you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot. And you can see there's just like a thin veneer of those colors on top of this pile. It's, the neonic use is being driven by crop production. This uh, image just shows the various active ingredients over time. Again, the amount of neonics on the vertical axis over time. The red, orange, and blue are a special type of neonics, and those are the ones that are coated on seeds. They're called the nitroguanidine neonicidoid insecticides. And clothianidin is, uh, sorry, imidacloprid is kind of uh, losing market share at the moment. Uh, clothianidin is mostly uh, covered on, on, on corn, and thymethoxam is mostly uh, soybeans, cotton, corn. So this increase over time, mainly starting in 2004, is because of these insecticides being applied to those seeds, to those commodities. And then this shows just the different commodities. Um, this is um, neonics over time, again, broken out by different types of crop species. You can see the majority of the use is being used on corn, soybeans, and cotton. So those three crops are driving the use of these insecticides. But these data were kind of unavailable before Maggie figured out she could compare these publicly available databases to kind of reveal these numbers. And at the time, which was back um, based on 2011 data, at the time when we published our paper, we estimated anywhere from about 80 to 100 percent of the corn seed was being treated, and anywhere between kind of 35 and 40 percent of the soybean seeds were being treated. The data that we based that estimate on stopped in 2011. Subsequently, a new batch of data have been released, and now we have data up to 2014, and so we can revise those numbers a little bit. But a remarkable detail is that these were our previous data stopped in 2011. The amount of these neonics being used annually has doubled since then. Right, so we're actually, sorry, I said annually. The amount of uh, neonics that have been used between 2011 and 2014 actually doubled. Right, so large com companies have given a lot of lip service to reducing the amount of neonics or optimizing the neonics, when in fact, behind the scenes, what we've seen is a doubling of the deployment. If you want to know what that looks like, you can go to the U.S. Geological Survey, and they have these maps that show insecticide or fungicide or 
herbicide use patterns. And this is the low estimate for use of neonics in, um, in over time. So this first figure shows 2003. That's the amount of clothianidin used. A common name of clothianidin is poncho, so the poncho seed treatment. And you can see there's none used in 2003. It really started to ramp up in 2004. By 2011, most of the corn belt is well blanketed with this amount. Uh, and the figures here are pounds per square mile. Keep in mind, we're applying milligram amounts to an individual seed. So that's a lot of deployment over time. So that's 2011, and that's 2014. So just notice, I'll go back and forth, that it's the darkening that matters. That's where the doubling comes from. It's not that the extent is changing that much. It's that the amount applied per seed is going up. And talking to industry colleagues, I haven't gotten a good explanation of why that amount applied to seed is going up. Anyway, um, that amount on seeds is being driven by corn. Um, and so this is the amount of used in different crops over time. And this is the amount of clothianidin, the, the, the chemical I was just talking about. And you can see the amount on corn just keeps going up. But remarkably, in 2015 and 16, almost none is used. And that's not because none is used. That's because uh, the data are no longer available. So the USDA and USGS were doing their surveys in a certain way. They've changed how they're doing their surveys, and now it's not captured at all. So the amount of neonics that have been used in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 is totally blind to us because the data are just not available. Now that's a little bit concerning. And the reason that they stopped collecting these data, uh, it's posted on the website, is that they, uh, they discontinued making estimates for seed treatment application of pesticide because of the complexity and the uncertainty. So it turns out that most farmers don't know what's on their seed. About 50% of farmers have no idea there's an insecticide on their seed at all. They're not deploying this stuff consciously, and that's problematic. So let's return to the pest control issue. That was a little bit of tangent upon just on, on the amount of neonics being used and kind of where they're being used. And if you were to look at the kind of the, the label for Insect, uh, neonic treated corn and soybean seeds, and what they can control, this would be the list. In corn, you can see the list there. Nothing that's really going to keep folks up at night. The worst pest on there is black cutworm, from my perspective, because it's kind of more of a perennial issue. These other ones are um, kind of harder to find. And in soybeans, more problematic pest on here is uh, uh, bean leaf beetle, um, because it kind of shows up annually. But these generally are called secondary pests which of course by definition means they're not our primary concern. There are other insect pests out there that keep farmers up at night and they're not on this list. So these animals kind of eat around the edges of yield. They're not the ones challenging yields directly. Again, they're secondary pests. Here's a little bit of history from the, uh, the realm of integrated pest management. So this is the paper generally attributed to introducing integrated pest management to the world. It's published in 1959 in an obscure California-based journal, and they, inter they introduced the integrated control concept. This was Stern et al. 1959. It's a classic paper in the world of entomology and pest control. And these folks identify four different types of pests, non-economics, occasional, perennial, and severe. And then they align those different types of pests with different type of control options. Okay? So insects rarely need control, they occasionally need control, they often need control, or they frequently need control. What we have with seed treatments are occasional pests that we're treating as a frequent problem. So we're treating every seed every year in corn and soybeans, more or less, for pests that aren't around very much. So there's just a disconnect, which is why there's a problem, in my opinion, on the landscape in terms of how we're controlling these things. And the part of the problem is kind of the knock-on effects of using that much insecticide over that wide of space. You're just causing problems that aren't necessarily, that it'll need to be caused if we aligned kind of the use pattern with the risk a little bit better. Okay, so back to this list. I give you my little IPM history. I'll give you a quiz on that later. Um, but note that that is not on the list, right? So slugs aren't on the list. So there's nothing in this use pattern that can defend you against slugs. Slugs, again, are mollusks. They're not defendable by these guys. So my student Maggie asked this question, do neonic insecticides exacerbate slug problems? And she did it properly in one field season with this experimental design. Right, so I'm going to show you some of the gory details so you see what we see. 
In this experimental design, she did a Latin square design with six replicates of each treatment, two treatments. One is a naked seed, that's the black squares. The other one is a treated soybean seed. That treated soybean seed had insecticides and fungicides um, coated on the seed in a package called Cruiser Max, which is a Syngenta-based product. <laughs> the fungicides have nothing to do with the story that I'm about to tell you, and I'll show you some uh, video evidence of that, but otherwise you just have to take my word for it. Um, we had these uh, were quarter acre plots, so much bigger than your average entomological plots, which are typically uh, 40 feet long and like four rows wide or something like that. But we wanted to isolate some effects of predators and slugs in the middle of these plots. And we planted our soybeans on 30 inch rows. Most soybeans in, in the country are planted on much narrower rows, but we wanted wide rows so we could walk down the rows and sample things without trampling plants. So we had some expectations when we set up this experiment, right? So we knew we were going to have, uh, we, we were pretty sure we were going to have a lot of slugs, um, and we were going to have plots that had seed treatments and plots that didn't have seed treatments. And we had some uh, expected outcomes. So in terms of act, uh, predator activity density, we would expect that to go down with the insecticides around, okay? Because the insecticides might be limiting the predator populations, so we expected that to go down. We expected predation to come down uh, in the same way. We thought maybe the slug activity density would go up because maybe there are fewer predators around and the slugs would be happier. We expected the slug dam uh, the leaf damage to go up because there would be more slugs. We thought that the soybean stands would be fewer so we wouldn't have as many plants per acre and we thought that our soybean yield would go down when we had the insecticide there but <laughs> slugs were the main concern. And more or less our predictions came to be true which is remarkable. It's difficult to predict the future and somehow um, Maggie and I figured it out. So here, um, so we, we measure predator activity density because because density per se is difficult to measure. So we just measure kind of the, how many in animals are in an area and they're kind of running around. So this is activity density, not a pure density. And that dropped by about a third. The predation of those things on slugs dropped by a third. Uh, slug activity density went up. So where we had the insecticides, we actually found more slugs, confirming that image I showed you before. Our leaf damage actually went down. This happens to be the case because we have an insect in the system. And this year, bean leaf beetle was particularly abundant. And the insecticide did its job and reduced the amount of damage to the soybean plants. <clears throat> but we also had a fair amount of slug feeding. And because of that slug feeding, our soybean stands were 19% lower compared to where we had the insecticide to where we didn't. And we actually had 5% lower yield on the plots where we had the insecticide. Let me just show you four figures so you see what we see, right? Here on the vertical axis, we just have yield. The horizontal axis is soybean plants per acre. As the number of soybean plants per acre goes up, our yield goes up. That's wonderful to see. If we didn't see that, we'd have a problem. But notice the color of the points. Where we have the insecticides, we actually have fewer plants per acre and the less uh, lower yield. Okay? And again, this is a, these are slug-infested fields. This figure brings the slugs together with the soybean plants. So the horizontal axis is the number of slugs per trap. Again, it's the number of slugs we find underneath our shingles. And again, the vertical axis here is just soybean plants per acre. As the number of slugs goes up, the number of soybean plants per acre comes down, which of course means our yields are coming down. But notice the color of the dots. Where we have more slugs, we have the insecticide, and where we have the insecticide, we have fewer plants per acre, which means lower yield. And then let's tie in the predators. Okay, so these are ground beetles, soldier beetles, row beetles, things that like to eat slugs. Here on the vertical axis, we have predation. So to measure predation, we take a caterpillar, we put a pin through the back end of that caterpillar, and we put that pin into the ground. And then we come back occasionally to see if anything's eaten it. In a perfect world, we would do this with a slug, but slugs don't have exoskeletons. So if you put a pin through the back end of a slug and put that pin to the ground, what does the slug do? It wriggles away. It pulls itself off the pin, right? Uh, which is why we have two-tailed slugs in central Pennsylvania. No one else has those. <laughs> That's the best joke I have. But anyway, so in a perfect world, we would do this with slugs, but we, in all our capacity to figure things out, have not been able to figure out how to confine slugs to a single location. So we've We've done this uh, repeatedly. We put a slug there and we've surrounded it with salt. They get frustrated, they cross the salt and they kill themselves. We've surrounded them with brass. Um, they cross the brass and they kill themselves. We've done it with copper, two metals that are supposed to confine slugs. They get frustrated and they kill themselves. We tried to um, 
kind of la put little tethers on them, like little lassos around slugs, and put that into the ground. Doesn't work. So we can't control slugs. <laughs> so we use caterpillars, which we can just put a pin through. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you in a second why, the, why this is still a valid approach. So the uh, vertical axis is predation. The bigger the number, the better. We'd love to have 100% predation. Um, and then we wouldn't have any pests, if we don't think. And the horizontal axis is slug predators per trap. So that's the number per trap. And we just use pitfall traps, which we, we sink a little cup into the ground. These animals bumble into the cup. We go out there and count them. So as the number of slug predators goes up, our predation on those caterpillars goes up. But again, notice the colors on the dots. On average, where we have the insecticide coated on the seeds or the black dots, we have fewer slug predators and we have less predation compared to where we don't have the insecticide on the seed. And let's connect this to slugs. So here is that same predation number that's over there. The higher the number, the better, based on caterpillars. This is the number of slugs per trap. This figure tells us a couple things. One, it tells us that the predation on those caterpillars is actually a pretty good proxy for our slugs, because as predation comes up, the number of slugs per trap goes down, implying that they're feeding on both things, not only our slug uh, kind of proxy, but the slugs themselves. Um, and it tells us that predators can control slug populations. So as predation goes up, number of mm -hmm. slugs per trap comes down. But again, on average, where we have the insecticides coated on the seeds, we have less predation and more slugs per trap, which is the opposite of what you expect from a pest management tactic you're buying. Right? You don't expect it to be making things worse. So what we have here is an example where the neonic insecticide coated on the seed is making biological control um, not work. So it's disrupting biological control. And this is happening because the insecticide is moving from the plant to the slug to the beetle. These data show the amount of insecticides in these various animals and the plants. So um, we show here two active ingredients, clothiandin and thymethoxam. Thymethoxam is the insecticide coated on the soybean seeds that we bought, but the first metabolite of thymethoxam is clothiandin, so both active ingredients are in the system. And we have, um, we have our soybeans and our slugs, and our soybeans and our slugs, and we have uh, untreated in gray and treated plots in red. You can see by seeing some level in the untreated plots that we have a legacy effect of neonics that were there in previous seasons, so neonics can persist in the soil. But we also see that we have a certain amount in the plant, and that plant um, then passes it along to the slug, and the slug picks it up from the plant. And we have about 100 uh, parts per billion of clothiandin and about 100 parts per billion in the slugs of thymethoxam. So that's about 200 parts per billion per slug. And we know from work in other systems that this can kill insects, right? So we know um, that very little insecticide is needed to kill bees, and actually about five parts per billion can kill a bee. This particular study was in the realm of 10. Um, but then we know um, in other systems that uh, similar predaceous beetles, it takes about 100 parts per billion to kill these beetles, but we're double that, okay? So we know the insecticide is in the slug, and then the beetle picks it up. And I'll just give you a visual representation of what this looks like. So that is a ground beetle. Um, that's a ground beetle that likes to eat slugs. That um, particular, whoop, 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 whoop. All right. All right. At least we have that on tape, audio, right? So there's a, a normal beetle. So that beetle recently ate a slug, and that slug had been feeding on a soybean plant grown from an untreated seed. You can see it's a very nimble animal. Every once in a while it falls on its back for no good reason. It can right itself and it can zip right around that little dish. Here we have an example of a beetle that ate a slug. That slug had been feeding on a soybean plant grown from a treated seed. So the insecticide is in this system. Clearly that animal is not doing very well. It ate a slug and its slug is kind of paying it back. Right? Here we have one that's particularly lethargic. If we flip that guy over, it won't right itself very easily. So clear signs of neurotoxicity. It can't operate its limbs. It's just kind of struggling. Sad, isn't it? And then here we have an example where um, the slug survived the interaction with the ground beetle, but the ground beetle was messed up. From this, we, we can or surmise that the animal got just a little bit of slug material in its mouth parts. We don't know how much, but that um, caused problems for the beetle. So it doesn't seem that the animals need to get too much from the slugs, just some, and the, and the insecticide can pass. So we ran into this, this challenge uh, in our mid-Atlantic no-till fields, and we then wanted to ask the questions, 
do neonics generally decrease the natural enemy populations across crop species, across geographic areas? And to do that, again, a meta-analysis is the way to do that. And so my former student, Maggie, asked these two questions. Do neonics generally reduce natural enemy populations in crop fields? And then do neonics cause similar reduction as other types of insecticides? So are neonics worse? Are they better? Are they softer? Or what, compared to other things? And to do this, she did a meta-analysis over 20 independent studies that were mostly from the United States, from some European studies, mostly in corn and soybeans. And in corn and soy, the seed-applied neonics decreased natural enemy populations by about 20%. And this was very similar numbers to what we find in our systems, about 20% reduction by using these neonic insecticides, which appear to be a very targeted, targeted application, but are having wider effects than anticipated. And notably, the pyrethroids, which are a main class of insecticides that were around before neonics, are causing the same type of decrease as the neonics. So neonics are no better than their, close, uh, than their, their, their kind of counterpart in the world. Pyrethroids are typically are sprayed all the way across the field rather than just a targeted application. Right? So pyrethroids and seed-applied neonics, neonics have equivalent negative effects. So from these data, I say that an insecticide is an insecticide is an insecticide. So just because we're coating on seeds doesn't mean that it, it has a potential to cause less problem. <laughs> to kind of pile on a little bit, we know um, that slug benefits, slug populations benefit from having fewer populations, uh, sorry, fewer predators, sorry for stumbling a little bit here, um, but we also know that they might benefit because they hide under this residue. Right? So in a no-till field like this, they might hide under that residue and they might be more comfortable. So if that residue is breaking down more slowly, it would give slugs a lot, uh, even more of a place to hide. So we asked this question recently, do the neonics slow decomposition of, these, of this residue in crop fields? And if so, is that residue persisting longer? Right? So one detail about neonics that is a little bit frustrating when you get to know them is that very little goes up into the plant. So we coat a certain amount on the seed, only less than 5% of the amount that's coated on the seed actually goes into the plant. That leaves 95% of the active ingredient coated on the seeds available to the environment. So some goes into adjacent waterways, some stays in the soils, some are taken up by field adjacent plants or trees, and then can be transferred to insects there. So very little active ingredient is actually useful here. But um, Knowing that so much is left in the soil, my student Kirsten asked this question, do neonic seed treatment influence decomp decomposer communities and decomposition? And to do this, she did a big field study where she used a lot of litter bags. So she put um, uh, rye straw in these uh, bags and then tracked their decomposition. Uh, one of the first things she did is to bring these, uh, a subset of these bags into our lab and she extracted the invertebrate communities that colonize those bags. So these are the things that facilitate decomposition and most of them are arthropods. So we're talking about columbolins, we're talking about soil mites, we're talking about isopods, those type of things. And she quantified their populations. In this experiment, she had untreated plots where no insecticide was added. We had the seed coat, so just the neonic on the seed, and she also had a broadcast application of pyrethroid, kind of as a benchmark. And she found that for, for millipedes, particularly this one invasive millipede, um, these are nutrient cyclers, and she's a cyclist, so she puts this. Um, that the, um, the neonic had a very little effect on these millipede populations, but the pyrethroid did. So perhaps in this sense, the neonics aren't doing as much um, negative work in these fields as some other things. Um, similarly, the mite populations were not strongly affected by the neonics, but they were affected by the pyrethroids. Um, but the, uh, an important difference comes when you look at the average columbolin density. So columbolins are also known, known as springtails. They chew on residue and make it available to bacteria and stuff to be uh, degraded even further. And then she found a significant effect of the seed coat and, but, but not the pyrethroid, but you can imagine a little larger sample size we might see an effect of, of both. So um, Kirsten also brought a lot of these litter bags in and evaluated the amount of decomposition that has occurred, so the rate of decomposition over time. Um, and she did this in various batches. And if you look at the, the, the batches individually, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on. There's some uh, little differences that are kind of higher to figure. So this is the amount of litter remaining kind of over time. And the more litter remaining, the slower the decomposition. Okay? And the green line is the control, and the uh, orange line is where the neonic was. And in the later batches, you start to see an effect at the end of the season 
of, uh, or, or the end of the batch of the neonics. But the most remarkable result occurred after the total three years of exposure in the field. So this is bags that were out there for three years. And this is the percent litter remaining over, um, and, we, and she just has the last year on here. But the, the difference starts to expand by the end of the time in the field. So at the end of the experiment, we have about a 10% difference in the amount of decomposition between the, tr the bags that were taken from the insecticide treated plots and the ones where no insecticide was used. So the neonics are significantly slowing by about 10% the decomposition rate of the material in the field. And based on our invertebrate sampling, it may be associated with the, uh, with the uh, springtail population. And if the springtails aren't are around as much to contribute to decomposition, maybe more residue is hanging out in fields longer, and that's contributing to our slug problem. So the slug problem seemed to be a one-two punch, or at least a two-part punch, maybe more of fewer predators and then residue that stays around longer and makes the slugs a little bit happier. So when we use, um, when we have early season pests, we expect some trophic interactions to occur to help regulate that pest. Okay, so the herbivore is the pest here. We expect some uh, interactions to occur, but what's happening when we have the insecticide coated on the seeds is that the effect of the natural enemy on the plant is being knocked out because the, uh, the plant is having a negative effect on the natural enemy, right? So that insecticide in the plant is actually working against the system by taking out the predators. But what we really want to know from an extension perspective is can we figure out a way to help farmers kind of reestablish these connections so that the problem can kind of go away. And this is kind of the last portion of my talk and I can do it in about five minutes, so we'll be good here. So this is a, a, a farmer who's grown to be a buddy of mine. His name is Lucas Criswell. He farms in Union County, which is about an hour east of the State College area. And this is the very first field he took me to when he told me he had a slug problem. This is a barley field. This picture is taking, taken in March, and that field is being slowly taken away by slugs. And Lucas made the simple observation to me as, as we were standing there, it's all credit to him, is that this is a pretty clean field when it comes to weeds, like there's no weeds in there. So if those slugs want to eat something green, their only option is barley. So his question is, can we give them something else? I was like, wow, geez, I don't know, Lucas, that's a fantastic idea though, thank you for saying that. And so we, I got a little bit of money, I wrote the grant, and we did the experiment at the research farm, at, uh, Penn State's research farm in central Pennsylvania, and then at Lucas's farm over in Union County. And we did this in corn and we did this in soybeans. This image shows soybeans to give you a sense of the experimental layout. The data I'll show you are from corn. This um, plot in the middle shows you our main manipulation. And this is simply soybeans, cereal rye, soybeans, cereal rye, soybeans, cereal rye. So we established between the soybeans row and a single pass in the spring, we established cereal rye. The cereal rye would then be killed with an herbicide later in the season. These would be glyphosate resistant soybeans, so they're not gonna die and we can take out and take out the plants and not worry about competition. And we compare that to the plots on either side where we just have soybeans with nothing between the rows. And we hypothesize that having something between the row would just give the slug something else to eat and maybe increase the number of predators out there just by diversifying a little bit. And heck if that's not what we saw. So on the vertical axis, we have the slug rating. So we rate slug damage from a, on a zero to four scale. A zero is no slug, the four is the plants nearly dead from slugs. And then we said where we have no cereal rye between the row and where we had cereal rye between the row. So just based on these data alone, we cut the amount of damage to the soybean plants and the corn plants in half just by having something else out there in the field. So that's just a dilution effect, not too surprising, but it's nice to see. But the number of ground beetles went through the roof when we had rye between the rows, right? So this is a number of individual ground beetles where we had no rye between the row, where we had rye between the row. And the number of beetles tripled when we had the rye between the rows. So Lucas, being a, a, a kind of a, a um, impatient person and a progressive person, went and did this without telling me. Right? He doesn't need to call me, he's got his farm, it's about an hour for me. Lucas is a cover crop user from the start, right? So every spring after he, established, after, after he harvests his cash crop, he established a cereal rye as his cover crop. So this cereal rye cover crop was established the previous fall. That cover crop is growing and providing organic inputs into the soil and keeping the soil coverage and reducing erosion until the next spring when he's planting his corn. When he established his cereal rye though, he left 30 inch gaps. Those 30 inch gaps are where he's gonna plant his corn, okay? So this is the same thing that we did, except he's doing it smarter because he's using a cover crop he would plant anyway and just making it more amenable 
to corn planting by leaving these gaps in 30 inch spacing. Okay, so this is him planting his corn that following spring, and it worked so well, and he had so little slug damage that he started doing this. So this is called planting green. So he's planting into a standing green cover crop. And that cover crop is there for kind of soil fertility benefits, for erosion control. But he's planting his corn into it, and then one to seven days after planting, he's going to come back and put an herbicide on that system to kill that uh, cover crop slowly. Right? Again, his neighbors um, approached him and said, this is stupid, Lucas. You're going to lose your farm. It's not the way people farm around here. You're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb. Lucas has shown them because his yields go up every year he does this. It's a remarkable system, and now he's really committed to it. Um, and this is kind of the pictures he would take after establishment. So this would be the corn coming up through the cover crop. Uh, this is soybeans that he didn't roll, so some years um, he just plants in the standing, standing cover crops like this. Other years he rolls it. So this is how he kind of invested uh, in his planting system now. So this is a corn planter. And if we were standing here, the, cover, uh, the planter is coming at us. Each row has its own articulated roller on the on the on the on the on the row unit okay so here are the opening wheels then we have a roller that the seed will be dropped behind it and when he plants his corn now or his soybeans now it looks like this from an entomologist perspective this is this is fantastic because it's habitat right so this is this area the corn or soy is going to come up between the rows in between the rows we have this thatch that thatch is doing three wonderful things one it's providing an alternative food source for those slugs so this is going to slowly die over two weeks because it's been hit with glyphosate. Slugs actually like dying rye more than they like the cash crop of corn or soybeans. So it's providing an alternative food source, diluting the damage they'll do. This is also providing habitat for natural enemies. That's the second benefit. So it's, it's providing an alternative food source. It's providing habitat for natural enemies. And it's providing weed control. So you don't need as much herbicide on the field when you have this type of thatch between the rows. This is what it looks like later on. So this is an untreated, so no BT corn here. This is an untreated, untreated corn. And he is, um, he's getting 250 bushels per acre, which is higher than in the average in Pennsylvania. He's doing everything um, kind of with soil quality and IPM in mind. And he's done some side-by-side -side comparison. So this is a, an Acre Max product, which is fully treated and traded. So there's stuff coated on the seed. There's genes inside the plant that protect it from caterpillar feeding, but he's getting an equivalent yield with his um, untreated, untraded corn as he is on the acre max. This year was closer to 200 bushels per acre, but the point is that there's not much of a difference between the two, yet he's saving $9,000 a year in pesticide costs. So his chemical dealer doesn't give him a Christmas card anymore, <laughs> but his input costs are down, but his profits are up just by farming slightly differently. Being scientists, of course, we are curious about how this is working. We had a little bit of data that said that this would be a good idea. Lucas acted on it far more aggressively than I would have liked. But after the fact, I um, got some funding, and this is a uh, former postdoc of mine, Marion Legall, who started asking systems uh, questions in this system to figure out how it's working. And so in this set of experiments, which is all done in farmers' fields, including Lucas's, we have a number of slugs and pitfall traps here where we had no cover crop, where we have a cover crop that's managed conventionally, which means it's killed two weeks before planting, so it's brown at planting, or where we have a green cover crop that's green at planting, just what I just described. And we get, on average, the fewest slugs where we're planting green, um, and then the damage by those slugs is equivalent. So we see less damage when we're planting green. Again, that planting green, that living green cover crop is reducing the slug damage. And then we've also done this in fields where we have a seed treatment or not. So again, we have the average number of slugs here, no cover crop, treated, untreated, um, brown cover crop at planting, treated, untreated, and a green cover crop, treated, untreated. We see our lowest slug populations where we're planting green with no seed treatment. So the insecticide isn't there to mess things up. And we've seen uh, in yield, uh, there's a little bit of a yield drag, but the farmers that are doing this will take that yield drag because they don't have Pest population to deal with. Uh, in this in this example, so this is one field like this was Lucas's field. This was a guy down the road named Joe Anker. Joe found equivalent yield, so it depends on your quality of management. So that's just a little bit quick diversion. And this is where I'll wrap up. So from this little story about slugs, we know that conservation biocontrol can work in Pennsylvania crop fields. We have enough predators, 
And if we can serve them, they can serve the purpose of helping control pests. Um, we know that growers that have a slug infested field should use IPM. In my opinion, all growers should use IPM, but that's not the way the current system is kind of established. So growers that have slug problems need to step out of kind of the mainstream and focus on their natural honey populations, which will recover if you give them a chance. By our math, it takes about three to five years for these populations to come back once you take insecticides out of the fields and, and those uh, predators can colonize fields and the populations can grow. Um, planted green, which is a, a kind of a step maybe too far for a lot of farmers, but sort of for some farmers it is working great. Lucas is doing it on 1,800 acres. Uh, planted green appears to have promise for slug control and provides this one-two punch of distracting slugs and making them available for predators that we're conserving. But it can't work without IPM. I've had growers that have done this very thing, but keep their, their general insecticide program on those fields, and it turns into a mess. And they call me and yell at me. I'm like, well, what kind of insecticides did you use? Well, yeah, the same old thing. Like, there's part of the problem. You need to be a little bit more patient. It has to work with IPM. But if you're doing this, we're going to get these other benefits, right? We're going to get less erosion. We're going to get more soil organic matter, less pesticides. Profits can go up if our yields stay the same. Oh, last point. So Lucas, um, back there in the middle, he is one of the board members of an organization called the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance. No-Till Alliance is very into uh, the movement, the soil health movement. They're very focused on soil health. Some of our research has allowed them to see that IPM is a key piece of soil health. So they're doing no-till. They're planting diverse rotations with cover crops, but now they're also incorporating IPM. And the beautiful thing is, is I'll invite them to my field days. Right? So if I go to an extension talk, this is Lucas talking right before me. I'm waiting to talk, but Lucas has already set the crowd up. He's the farmer saying farm things. I'm a bumbling scientist saying bumbling science things. But if he says it first, it works, <laughs> right? And I'll just say, I don't know, go ask, go ask Lucas. And we have a, a kind of a nice one-two punch and a bunch of his colleagues, guys back in this picture, uh, were doing research on their farms and they've turned into advocates for the same, same type of agriculture, right? So I've already told you all this stuff. That's kind of my take home messages. I've had a bunch of funding. This is uh, planting red. So that's crimson clover, one of the prettier pictures I've taken. But farmers are doing this with different type of crops. We mainly study cereal rye. Um, this is actually down in Western Maryland. Um, and a bunch of folks have helped with this research. Of course, I'm just kind of supervised it, and other people are getting sweaty and their hands dirty. Occasionally I do, but mostly it's these folks. And with that, I'm happy to take any, any questions you might have. aside from the slugs, but what's the difference in the amount of pesticide applied on a seed frame? I don't know what difference between because millions of seeds. Yes. That's a wonderful question and I'm glad you asked it. So there is no doubt by moving to a seed applied insecticide, we're applying less amount of insecticide per acre. Um, these numbers might be slightly wrong, but they're in the ballpark. If we were to use uh, chlorpyrifos, which is a, a common organophosphate that's been used in corn production forever, and apply the recommended amount per acre, we would apply 453 grams. If we did this, it replaced the chlorpyrifos with this, one of these seed applied insecticides, the neonics, we'd be using seven grams. But the difference is, is the level of toxicity. The amount needed to kill I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the amount needed to kill if you use a neonic is a fraction of the amount needed to kill of that chlorpyrifos. Chlorpyrifos is one of the more toxic insecticides available. Neonicotinoids, if you remember your, your grade school schooling, are the new nicotine-like chemicals, right? They're based on nicotine. Uh, imidacloprid, which was the first neonic introduced to the market, is 10,000 times more toxic than nicotine, which was its biological inspiration. So it's not, it doesn't come down to just the amount being deployed. It has to be a, um, an, integrated, an integrated effort to take the amount and the toxicity into account. And when you take the toxicity into account, the neonics are off the charts. They're the most effective insecticides that have been, ever been introduced. Yeah, and, and they're not good at killing everything, but they're particularly good at killing insects. And what's the relative cost? Are they saving money? Uh, well, I mean, your your research says they don't need to pay. Correct. Probably the seed companies wouldn't appreciate 
No, I'm not. I'm not their favorite person, right? Right. Um, but the, the cost, actually, the, plot, the cost gets into a, a more kind of a more nuanced conversation because, as I mentioned earlier, farmers don't know. Most farmers don't know what's on their seeds, and because of the way, say, corn seed or soybean seeds is sold, do you have a good understanding of what the cost of each piece of that seed is? So, if we think about corn seed, you have the the genetics, which is kind of the packaging, right? Then you have the um, the the genetically modified trait that's been inserted to stop either caterpillars or below ground kind of root, uh, uh, beetle pests of corn. And then you have a fungicide, you have an insecticide, and there might be other things on there. But those things aren't um, itemized on a receipt, right? You just pay, let's say, $250 for a bag of corn seeds. And then you have to do a little bit of mental math. If you know what's on your seed, then you might be able to apportion each of those ingredients to the cost of the seed. So uh, a study that's just about to come out has shown that if a farmer has to spray, um, then he needs to know the rate, he needs to know the active ingredient, he knows, needs to know the mixing properties so he can get it in the tank properly, and he has a far greater awareness of what's there. Compared to if it's just coated on the seed, then, he's, then they become, it's unnecessary, you don't need to know. So they're very disconnected from this sort of insecticide deployment or any type of pesticide deployment. They just don't need to know. So the cost is probably on a per acre basis less for the neonate. Um, and that's part of the reason it's used so widely is because it seems to be a relatively inexpensive way to go. Um, but I think it's safe to say that we don't need it on 150 million acres of United States cropland, but it's kind of become everywhere because it's cheap and, and the companies are now selling it as the default setting. And I've had farmers call me and complain that they actually have to pay more to get an untreated seed. And I don't know how true that is across the country, but I certainly know individuals who have told me that. And part of the justification that I've heard is because it's getting something that's different, like it's out of, this, out of the normal kind of production pathway. If you want something out of the normal production pathway, it's going to cost you a little bit more. I like, I don't know, if you want to buy a Toyota that's bright orange, you might have to pay a little bit more for it because it's out of the typical production pathway. That's a bad example, but I think you understand my point. Yeah. <laughs> Please. You mentioned that planting green is step too far for some farmers. And I'm curious if that is just because of tradition or because of some other drawbacks to planting green that they're worried about. Sure. A system like this where you're planting green is more management intensive. And it certainly is the case that many farmers in this country are already strapped for time as it is. They, they, they have their um, whatever acreage they have and getting all the plants into the ground and then all the fertilizer out and all that stuff um, stretches them thin every, every day, right? And to have a system that's a little bit more management intensive is a step too far because they can't manage the crops that they have or the acres that they have right now. Um, so what we found is that the farmers that have uh, kind of more health than average or that have smaller farms are the ones that can manage this type of effort. So I'd be really surprised if this effort kind of took off nationwide because you know farms in GI states, on average, I, I guess I don't know the number, but they're they're much much bigger than Pennsylvania farms. On average, we're like 250 acres. Out there, I think 3,000 acres might be typical. I'm, again, I'm out of my realm a little bit, but there are big farms out there where this probably wouldn't take. But a nice thing about Pennsylvania is that we have a patchwork of natural areas and unnatural areas. So IPM is more likely to work in the east anyway because we have these refuges from which these predators can colonize fields. In Iowa, it's 91% corn and soybeans. There's not much natural habitat left. So it's difficult to see where a reservoir these good insects could come from. Or yield. If the analysis has, of course, not only U.S. publications, but mm -hmm. as well. So this could be also affected by the agribusiness of the uh, way they practice their agriculture over in those areas. Okay. Is there a difference? So my experience is that large-scale farming in Europe and large-scale farming in the United States isn't that different. Um, I've been able to spend some time in France and Sweden recently, and those big fields look like our big fields. I don't know all the details, so you may be onto something, and our meta-analysis would not take that into account. Meta-analysis just takes the published literature and extracts these kind of key figures we need to do the analysis. 
and would not account for those type of differences. Next, in fact, one of the benefits of meta-analysis is because those differences get washed away. And what we're actually studying is effect size rather than the actual numbers themselves. So if those things were at play, we would think the approach of using effect size would be removed because the effect size is more or less the effect of the treatment compared to the control, and it's the number that we generate based on that difference. I mean, there's more small farming. There, well, uh, the, in some places, yes. Like, but if you were in southern Sweden, for example, it looks just like the Midwest. If you were in central France, it looks large portions of it look just like the Midwest. I mean, it depends where you are. But I, I'm not discounting what you have to say. Um, it's probably valid, but it wouldn't come through in our analysis. Please. I am living in Color drop usage in the electronic sense. Color drop decrease water content. Actually, that can be a good thing. You, yes, let me answer your question, Jimmy. Yes, there are limitations to this, which is why it's a more heavily kind of a managed system. It's a system that needs more management. Right. But folks that are planting green actually will do it because of water management, because the, you know, in a wet year, the cover crop will suck more soil out of the water and actually prepare the soil for planting a little bit better. In a dry year, it will work against you, which again leads to why it's kind of more management intensive. In a dry year, Doing this is silly because all you're doing is taking too much soil out of the uh, moisture out of the water. But in a wet year, there's clear benefits to doing this. So again, it's a management intensive system and it's a dynamic system. You can't commit to plant green and plant green every year. You have to be able to switch it up time and time again. The other, uh, but there are other limitations of doing this is that you need to be able to establish your cover crop in the fall after the cash crops are off, establish this with enough time that it grows sufficiently uh, in the fall so they can get through the winter which means you might need to use a slightly shorter maturity corn or soybean to harvest early enough to establish the cover crop. And that's another limitation. And so we have certainly run into farmers who would never dream of doing this because they want the largest, longest maturity uh, of their corn or soybeans possible so they can get as much yield or what I would call perceived yield out of the field as possible. But each year, Penn State does variety trials um, of different maturities around the state and we find some of the shorter maturities are yielding just as well as like the 115 day corn that is pretty typical in the southern part of the state. So there is room, but a farmer has to be willing. So you asked whether there is this kind of tradition. Yeah, tradition works against some of this stuff also. It's, it's hard to change. So I, I, am, I will never push this down someone's throat. I offer my presentation, I answer questions, and if people take it, they take it. You know, there are limitations and it's more management intensive. Please. Roundup. We use a lot of that. Yeah, so um, one of the kind of contradictions of no-till agriculture is that it's reliant on herbicides, not just Roundup, but other um, herbicides. The, one of the limitations of our system is it relies on that post-planting application of glyphosate. Um, and we haven't figured out a way around it. So it's one of the costs of doing business in our realm. Um, I would prefer that it, it wasn't used as frequently, um, but it, it, it is, and it's just part of the system. Did you have a more specific question? Yeah, I've been getting a lot of bad last year. Uh -huh. Recently, with other treatments. Downside to, to whatever we might use. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in glyphosate because I don't have much expertise there. But there have been a lot of uh, kind of announcements about human health concerns from various organizations around the world. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, glyphosate has got a far better environmental profile than most herbicides on the market. Um, so if you compared glyphosate to, say, Paraquat, Paraquat's some pretty bad stuff. It's been linked to Parkinson's syndrome. Um, I would far prefer, far prefer to see glyphosate used more than before Paraquat. But um, I think I can say, uh, um, without reservation, that current agriculture uses glyphosate too much, the same way we use uh, neonic insecticides too much. There, need, there should be some moderation, but I don't know of any lever that could be shifted to, sh to move back that moderation other, other than just frustration by farmers. So glyphosate is running into some resistance challenges now, and my understanding is that use is, is moderating a little bit because folks are now more aware that they can select for uh, glyphosate-resistant weed. But it, it, glyphosate allows has allowed no-till to happen in the mid-Atlantic. So it's, um, I have a kind of a mixed feeling about it, but it's part of the system. He hasn't asked one yet, okay. 
Thank you. Awesome work, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh -huh. um, in addition to the toxins they produce, all the mollusks are major hosts of various huh. parasites. I'm wondering if there's thought about what are for things like myasis transmission. <laughs> I've never been asked that before. Holy cow. Um, so I, I guess, no, no, I haven't thought about that. Uh, we have been approached by various organizations that are concerned about other types of wildlife, uh, turtles, snakes, these oh, types of things. Like deer that eat oh. slugs or something. Okay. Um, but things that are more likely to be uh, slug predators, like turtles or snakes or be frogs. <laughs> Not frogs, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't deal with things with spines usually. Um, we've been contacted by organizations that were that are interested in their um, kind of performance in the field, how many there are in the landscape. Uh, and I haven't been able to have those kinds of conversations very easily because I don't know the type of effect that these what we call toxic slugs would have on those animals. There are studies that kind of keep emerging every year that show that eunuchs have a far greater influence on wildlife than initially anticipated just on the toxicological profile and kind of lab work that's been done. In fact, one study that came out in uh, just this past year as a science paper showed that birds that eat neonic treated seeds, just if they just eat five seeds and have a fair, fairly low amount of neonic in their systems, uh, these migratory birds will actually delay their migration by two or three weeks, and they won't get up into the Arctic until after all their peers, and then they have a hard time competing for, um, for nests and mates uh, because of that delay. Uh, and that's a fairly high profile paper and something comes out like that seemingly every couple months. And it, it certainly is the case that neonics were first introduced um, and people thought they were more or less the perfect insecticide, but now that, that sheen is being kind of worn away a little bit because of various reports like that and, and others. They're not as perfect as you might think. And because of their toxicity uh, and their ubiquity, those two things combining really uh, are, can be problematic. Any other questions? Oh, please. So are you saying any Yeah, without question. So in dry years, we don't have slug problems. One of the reasons that slugs are problematic in the mid-Atlantic is because we have more rain on average than other parts of the country. It's a pretty wet part of the world. I've heard that Memphis is pretty wet, um, but we have our own share of rain there in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, it's just a rainy place. Um, so the best control for slugs is a dry year. And so, uh, uh, so my big slug years have been 2012, 2014, 2017. And if they're followed by dry years, um, it really makes people's lives easier. It makes my life as a researcher a little bit harder. And students that are trying to make progress, we need to irrigate. Um, but that's this cost of doing business. Yeah, Dwayne? Yeah, a quick one. You know, thinking of the upper Midwest, Corn Belt, and so on, you know, in terms of Lemon tall grass prairie and so on. They persist and perhaps to some degree are resistant maybe to slugs or slug populations growing to levels. So is there anything that we can learn, even implement by way of using natives that may be less susceptible as colors, realizing they're limited in the scope of potential plants to work with by nature of their biology? Sure. Uh, so, so most of the slug work in the world has been done in kind of high alpine meadows in the uh, in the Alps, where scientists have really studied slug feeding preferences between different plant species. And um, the main species they've used is this gray garden slug because it's native to Europe. So, what we have is an exotic, um, you know, doing its thing here. Uh, so, we would have to do kind of those feeding trials to understand its influence on prairies of the Midwest. Um, as, as you know, I spent a fair amount of times in the prairies of Illinois. I don't recall seeing uh, slugs, but there are certainly native snails in there, and I would bet there's some level of uh, kind of coevolution between the native mollusk populations and those prairie plants. Some of those prairie plants are awfully hard to eat, so if given a choice, I imagine um, gray garden slugs would stay out of the prairie and stay in the, in the local farm fields rather than diving in there, but perhaps. If, um, if we were able to study that, but that work would have to be done. I'm not aware of North American based work studying uh, slug feeding preferences on native plants. That's all European work that I brought across. Do you have one more question? Um, yeah, you, you show some maps of USG collected data on estimated use on agricultural land and uh -huh. per square mile. Uh -huh. Is there a coverage of IPM? <laughs> no, not that I've ever run across. 
No. The interesting thing is that IPM used to be the standard in North American corn production. That all changed in 1996. Um, and that in 1996, that's when the first BT corn was introduced. And that is a good thing in itself. But what it seems to have done is it shifted in the mind of the agricultural community the need to control things uh, um, or the, the possibility of controlling things preventatively. So once you're using BT corn, which was targeting European corn borer at the time, your concerns about European corn borer went away. I mean, that, that was a remarkable product when it was first introduced, and it remains. The BT targeting um, European corn borer remains a remarkable product, and I'm a strong advocate for it. But I think that that use of a, of a technology changed the mindset of farmers. It used to be that they would track their insect pest populations, and if European corn borer egg masses were above a certain number, um, if they could, they would go out in their field and they would provide an application that would protect their corn. Once corn borer, um, once BT targeting corn borer was introduced, they didn't need to think that way anymore. And then every subsequent, many of the subsequent technologies have allowed them to put less emphasis on pest management. So now what we have deployed in most acreages across the country is a preventative tactic, right? So we have, uh, um, just let's take one of the, the Cadillac versions of corn out there. Uh, there's smart stacks is put out by bear. It has like eight BT genes in it, got an insecticide coated on the seed. It probably has um, two genes for herbicide tolerance and it has um, fungicides coated on the seed, if not something else. Uh, and farmers pay for that, but one of the things they're getting is peace of mind that a lot of the potential problems are be taken care of by that technology in the seed. And don't get me wrong, there's value there, but what I see as a problem is that's become the default setting. That's not being used as a tool, that's being used as the default setting. I would far prefer, uh, and I think a lot of my IPM-based colleagues would far prefer, that a lot of these uh, technologies were deployed more as an as-needed basis rather than the basis of the system. And unfortunately, just me talking to you guys isn't gonna change that. I need to keep working with farmers and find other ways, um, but I recognize that, again, this is a management heavy system that we need to do a better job finding kind of a less management intensive system so more farmers would kind of pick some up, pick up some of these ideas. Uh, you guys are good question askers. Okay. Well, why don't we give Dr. Tushner a hand? <laughs>